guests today um, are Jordan Cope and Michael Jones. Uh, we'll be speaking to Washington uh, outsider audiences about adversarial form influence on campuses. For those who don't know me, my name is Irina Zuckerman. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Washington Outsider. Uh, we've been doing a series related to foreign policy issues and now a crossover of foreign and domestic po policy focusing on influence campaigns in the United States. Uh, the issue of campus influence has gone uh, remarkably under the radar despite numerous reports and investigations primarily during the Trump administration. Um, it takes numerous forms. Some of it is direct funding of departments and programs. Some of it uh, comes ac across through the types of professors who are hired. Some of it is um, directly attributable to state actors. Others uh, benefit foreign state actors, but pass through domestic groups and also may reflect uh, US domestic policy. Um, but a lot of these policies are beneficial to adversarial interests. They affect students. Students are left essentially powerless with no tools uh, to uncover, much less to respond to these, uh, to these practices. Uh, Jordan, a recent law school graduate, and Michael, who's currently a graduate uh, student at the Harvard Kennedy School, will discuss the current situation from a perspective of the student body. First, what are those influences? How are they manifested, whether directly or indirectly? And second, we will turn to solutions. How can we empower students to be able to resist foreign propaganda and and ideology that may originate in the US but benefits our uh, foreign foreign interests. Jordan, let's start with you. Sure. First and foremost, it's a huge honor to be hosted today amongst such esteemed uh, guest and host. And so quick introduction. So I recently graduated from the University of Texas School of Law and had the privilege also of studying international relations and minoring in Middle Eastern studies there. And so my focus today, most appropriately, will be about the Middle East. And I think the foremost country of concern when it comes to foreign influence in American universities is that generally of Qatari money. And so it's important to contextualize in essence that university funding in the United States from the Qatari government is just one of its ways that the Qatari government, which is responsible for funding Hamas, one point one billion dollars since 2012 funding terrorist organizations throughout the middle east whether they be in uh, syria with ahrar asham whether they be in libya via gna proxies or even in yemen via the al islah party an offshoot of the muslim brotherhood the qatari government in essence has a larger scheme of trying to in essence whitewash its sins those being terror financing and islamist ideologies. And so it's not just when it comes to university funding that Qatar has engaged in such efforts, but it's even in things appealing to mainstream youth, not just my age, but even below. Soccer tournaments around the world are being funded by Qatar Airways, a state-run agency of the Qatari government. You see some of the world's largest clubs, such as Roma, uh, Bayern Munich, the World Cup even and being sponsored and FIFA, I think by Qatar Airways. And so it's just simple initiatives like this. But when it comes to universities, it's shocking. Um, since 1986 through 2018, it was discovered that Qatari funding in the United States and US universities has now totaled $5 billion. And just when I wrote an article in 2019, that figure was believed to have been $1.5 billion. It's unknown really just how deep Qatari financing of US universities actually is, but there's a trend often of what happens is that as noted by I believe Charles Small in Newsweek, is that generally where we see Qatari funding in universities, likewise comes, I would say more funding for institutions such as Students for Justice in Palestine and other orgs that are known to often perpetuate anti-Israel attitudes 
and just as often anti, maybe perhaps not just as often, but still strongly anti-Semitic attitudes. And so this is just part of a larger campaign that needs more awareness of what's going on. And the Qatar Foundation, a state-run NGO of the Qatari government, kind of ironic, I guess, state-run an NGO. But what we're now seeing is funding going to K through 12 schools in the United States, about $30.8 million to date. And what we're seeing is commitments in education to try to encourage students to become normalized to Qatar and its affairs and to associate it as it would any other Western country around the world. And it's to no coincidence that it's been noted that in the curriculum sponsored um, by the Qatari Foundation called the Mazdar curriculum, that apparently there are courses being taught called Express Your Loyalty to Qatar that have been at least previously taught. And it's very concerning, especially when you consider not just the age range that the Qatari government is trying to outreach to through its funding, but all of its efforts comprehensively, whether that be through soccer funding, whether that be through Al Jazeera Plus, a offshoot network of Al Jazeera, um, which is so strong amongst the youth my age now. I just looked at it on Facebook yesterday and 88 of my mutual friends happened to subscribe to the page and nobody knows where this influence is coming from. And that is a government that is committed to terrorism financing to weapons um, distribution throughout the Middle East and ultimately supporting very dangerous causes to the US. Thank you so much. I have, I have uh, many, many questions, but I'll get, I'll get to them after Michael uh, uh, shares his comments with us. I know Michael mentioned that Iran, for instance, does not appear to be as a direct funder of pro-Iran ideology on campuses, but nevertheless, we are seeing, you know, in many universities such as Princeton, MIT, and uh, many others, uh, faculty originating in Iran holding very pro regime positions, as well as indirectly uh, pro pro regime um, ideology being pushed through various means, even if they are not directly appear to be directly funded specifically by by Iran itself. We've seen the Alavi Foundation sponsor some universities in the past and um, it was shut down eventually, but not after sponsoring such schools as Sacred Heart University in Connecticut, for instance. So I, I'd like to hear from Michael about his view on what's going on. What are the sources supporting these ideologies? What are the dangers and how is it, how, 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 how is it being sold to the students? Well, thank you. And, um, you know, likewise, it's great to join uh, you both here uh, in, in such esteemed company, as, as Jordan rightly said. Um, I, um, most, of, most of my work, as you know, Irina, um, is, is focused on, uh, on Middle East regional issues, uh, particularly toward um, Iran as a geostrategic actor, um, which, um, uh, I, I think in these these high theory discussions that uh, we talk about, um, there's um, an inclination to think of uh, geostrategy and, and grand strategy as um, you know basically a giant chess game or, or game of risk. And there's certainly a, a level or an element to that. Um, but uh, as you rightly noted, there's also um, uh, the game at home as as it um, as it can be understood. And uh, there there is an issue of um, Iran and, and Iranian influence not receiving due attention um, on university campuses. Um, uh, it deserves to be said that um, there, there's essentially two major players on the world scene when it comes to uh, penetrating or, or trying to influence um, Western uh, institutions and, uh, and especially academic institutions. And that's uh, the Chinese Communist Party and, and, and of course uh, the Islamic regime in Iran. Um, uh, and these are, are both, uh, in many cases, overtly hostile to the system itself, uh, looking to sort of, sort of penetrate uh, known institutions or perhaps create new ones uh, in ways that allow them to disseminate um, their, uh, their favored reading of events or their favored um, line on certain issues in, in a way that's um, uh, that conducive to their interests and, and can reach Americans in a way that um, 
you know, regular geostrategy cannot. Um, so it, it deserves to be said just on top level that, um, you know, the, the reason why there is any success to either of these efforts um, is uh, because of the values of the liberal system itself. Um, these are actors and efforts that, that seek to take advantage of the openness of uh, liberal democratic society um, and uh, essentially seek to use the, the, um, good, uh, the good things about our society against itself, things like free speech and, and academic freedom um, and uh, other you know, free inquiry, things that um, essentially allow um, these academics and, and sometimes in many cases these agents uh, to say that um, you know, they're just engaging in the system like everyone else, which in, in many cases they are, uh, as you rightly noted, Arena. Um, uh, it's difficult, I think, for Iran, um, especially, to, uh, to access or engage in that behavior on the level that China has uh, because of several restrictions and, uh, and bans that, uh, many of which are still in place today, um, including most famously the 2012 ban on um, Iranian um, college and graduate students seeking to enter the country um, for educational programs related to energy um, or nuclear programs. Uh, but that's certainly, you know, and, and that's certainly been um, important policy uh, written in place originally by Obama and, and, and continues through Biden. Um, but uh, I think it deserves to be said that um, there is no such similar policy um, for regular scholarship um, beyond, you know, the hard sciences uh, when it comes to international relations or policy analysis or, or so on. Um, you have many people, um, like most famously uh, a couple months ago, um, uh, the, the case of Afrasiabi, who um, was, was uh, arrested um, after um, uh, being found to be an unregistered foreign agent of Iran, um, working specifically on the Iranian payroll, um, and yet writing for a number of high profile journals and working for, for uh, universities, including my own Harvard University, um, in, in ways that were very serious and very academic and, and, and uh, on from the outside, very legitimate, um, you know, producing scholarship that was ter that turned out to be um, uh, the product of, of um, the Iranian payroll. Um, so I think the uh, the important point here um, is that uh, we, as as lovers of the system, as defenders of the system of um, of academic freedom and uh, and free inquiry, uh, need to understand that there is there are in fact several um, Soviet style active measures campaigns uh, to influence and address Americans in their home country, uh, in many cases on their campuses, if not um, in Washington and in academic scholarship more generally. Um, and um, it, and in many cases, this thought isn't just coming from um, sworn agents of the regime, uh, like Afar Siabi, but rather uh, American-based academics or Western-based academics who uh, just find um, ideological common cause or, or happen to agree with some uh, of the policy platforms um, that, uh, that happen to favor uh, the Iranian regime's interests. So I think the important takeaway for us is that we need institutions to be uh, a little bit more skeptical of the potential motives and affiliations of um, uh, uh, fellows and um, professors and other academics that they bring in, um, it, because then otherwise, you know, as people accumulate these credentials and enter the academy, uh, they find themselves more and more legitimate, uh, such that when Afrasiabi was ultimately arrested, um, his defenders in the Iranian embassy pointed to his credentials as the basis for his defense, said, this is a, this is a nice Harvard man written for Princeton, so on, you know, what could possibly be the problem? Um, and uh, so, so I think that's the important thing is that we need a little bit more institutional skepticism and an understanding that there is a desire and an effort um, to, to address Americans within their own context. Uh, and uh, that, that that attentiveness might allow us both to guard ourselves against this kind of influence while uh, simultaneously understanding that uh, we can't destroy the system for the sake of the system. Thank you so much. And of course, I'll, I'll, I'll be right back to you with questions uh, further pertaining to what you just said. Um, I wanted to turn to Jordan and comment on something he mentioned uh, concerning the, the, the state funding and the correlation between 
that state funding and particular sentiments on campus. Now, funding of Middle Eastern Studies departments by foreign states is nothing new. Qatar didn't invent it. In fact, Saudi Arabia was uh, the first uh, major uh, funding of those studies. Although to be fair, it's not clear how much of it came from the very top, from the king and educational minister of education, but, but rather by private Saudi actors with royal standing, but nevertheless in their private capacities, uh, such as the Awalid bin Talal Foundation, uh, known for its center at, uh, at Georgetown, which allegedly uh, focuses on tolerance among religions. But if you examine the roots of Awalid bin Talal's activity, he has actually donated to Muslim Brotherhood causes and many of the much of the language reflected in that center also reflects Muslim Brotherhood ideology. So the question is, uh, the historic root of it goes back to the Cold War. The West encouraged Saudis and others to import a re conservative religious sentiments uh, to offset the spread of communism. Uh, since then, it was widely acknowledged to be uh, a mistaken approach, at least in the form that it took at the time. And Saudi Arabia has officially and openly moved away from doing so, even uh, freezing uh, Bin Talal's accounts, some of which were going to fund that very center. Qatar, however, picked up the mantle and continued funding precisely the same sort of ideology, a uh, very Muslim Brotherhood take on the Middle East studies uh, that erases uh, entire ethnicities from history and essentially um, promotes a very anti-Israel sentiment. The question is why? Why is Qatar promoting that particular type of thinking? What What are the benefits from that? And why is there so little transparency concerning that after all these decades of experience with funding suspicious causes, with seeing the indoctrination occur with seeing the collusion between uh, Islamism and the kind of leftist quote-unquote orientalist uh, approach. Uh, we've seen um, uh, Saeed's scholarship uh, concerning Middle East, which has essentially delegitimized, attempted to delegitimize a lot of Western understanding. What, what's going on? Why have we such trouble figuring out you know that this is problematic why is there no pushback against these universities that take this money uh why are the students so ill-equipped to question uh where the sources of the information they're getting i think that's a very good question i think first and foremost in regards to why is qatar pushing this islamist agenda i think it's always been i guess within the ideology of the monarchy. Um, Qatar was obviously one of the last to resist banning the Muslim Brotherhood, and it hasn't to date. And important to note is that support for Islamism is nothing new in Qatar. Um, for years, it's been known to have hosted a wide range of people within its borders that we would consider less than reputable. Um, Qaradawi, the ideological head of the Muslim Brotherhood, who has basically, uh, I guess, showed support for Hitler for quote unquote putting the Jews in their place or something of the like, who has supported the just who has justified the use of suicide bombings. Qatar also hosts um, uh, Khalid Mashal, one of the primary leaders of the Hamas, um, uh, the former head of the Hamas political bureau. It's always been generally within the ideology. And today it's to no coincidence that Qatar hosts Khalifa Asubay, one of the primary financiers of al-Qaeda and on top of that um, just many other major figures within the Afghani Taliban and so they even invited Khalid Sheikh uh, Mohammed one of the masterminds behind 9-11 back in the day the Qatari royal family um, to actually work in Qatar and then when there was arrest basically uh, warranted for him um, the Qataris actually helped him escape the country when the U.S. was supposedly closing in. And so why, I guess, does Qatar still support this ideology, going just to that question, is because during the Arab Spring, with the rise and the proliferation of Islamist movements throughout the Middle East, I think Qatar realized that it could capitalize 
on, in essence, protecting itself by supporting Islamist movements. Now, to your question, I guess, in regards to why is there no pushback, I think it's because Americans have a hard time realizing just how much of a threat Qatar actually is to American interests. One of our largest military bases in the world, Al Udaid, is located in Qatar. Um, it's associated with one of these hip and upcoming countries, hosting the World Cup, hosting these progressive channels such as AJ+, which many Americans don't even know. So a lot of the activity Qatar is involved in is covert. And so it's not just covert, but it's also presenting itself as if it is some one of these reforming, uh, reforming countries in the Persian Gulf, which it indeed is not. Um, it is effectively one of the only countries that hasn't banned the Muslim Brotherhood on the Arabian side of the Persian Gulf. So there needs to be more pushback. And I think the primary issue with at least Middle Eastern study programs is not just the fact that minority narratives are literally being removed. It's also the fact that in general, a lot of universities, I don't know, maybe not a lot, but definitely some have Israel study departments separately because the Middle Eastern studies departments are so hostile towards the Israeli studies. So students who are going to be graduating with the vanguard of regional degrees, a Middle Eastern studies degree, might actually graduate without ever hearing a narrative in regards to the pro-Israel side of history. And it's very concerning. It's very concerning that students can't identify. And the fact is, um, it, it's just, it's, it, it is a big concern. And so I think people need to realize that in regards to education and moving forward, the best steps we can do, because I believe section, is it 117 of the Higher Education Act mandates disclosures of $250,000 or more, which Qatar has definitely been exceeding. We need to create more transparency in the enforcement provisions of that act, which I believe have failed to account for like 70% of what are now known donations. And so we need better transparency. We need stronger fines for universities to make sure that if they do not, there are no penalty provisions, by the way, we need strong fines to ensure that if they do not comply, they will lose that funding. It's important in the matter of American security interests that we know where the funding is deriving from. And it's not just towards Qatari funding, but it's in regards to a lot of other um, sources of funding, such as that from the Chinese government with Confucius Institutes, which I'm not as much of an expert on to talk about. But it's important for the national security interest. Thank you. And I'll come back to, to, the, to that point momentarily. Uh, back to Michael about the 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 scrutiny that uh, the skepticism the skepticism that these academic institutions seem to be lacking. Um, Iran is a re remarkably ir illiberal uh, country under the Islamic Republic regime. Uh, it's known for uh, for hanging gays for. Um, forcing women to cover their hair at the risk of going to prison uh, for grotesque human rights abuses, exploitation of terrorism, and other issues that have traditionally been uh, strongly opposed by uh, left-leaning uh, students on campus. Uh, something like that 30 years ago would have been eliciting mass demonstrations. Even if they were ultimately ineffective, they would have happened. We are seeing silence on student campuses against these abuses. How would you explain that? Uh, why is this this lack of academic critique of the human rights uh, perversion by the Iranian regime, Michael? Well, that's an important question. Um, it's hard to really get inside every campus. Um, presumably, a lot of them are different. I can give you a story from experience. Um, when, um, when I wrote for the, the Cornell Sun, uh, I criticized um, an environmental movement there for saying, um, you know, for, for issuing a list of demands and so on. And I said, this is all, you know, very consistent. I understand uh, the point. Um, why is there no mention whatsoever of China? Um, you know, which of course is um, 
far and away, in my opinion, the most underrated uh, threat to uh, the, the global environment, to the climate, um, that um, uh, these sort of activists uh, tend to overlook. Um, you know, these, these are people speaking uh, quite a lot about Israel, for instance, and its um, uh, human, right, human rights abuses as they understand them uh, related to the, um, the university's ties, uh, but are silent uh, when it comes to the university's ties to China. Um, this is, I, I think, a, a problem that's hard to give one answer to, um, but uh, this contradiction does, does exist. Um, that um, these are people who are who are willing to denigrate the only democracy in the Middle East, but not uh, one of the greatest autocracies on the face of the earth. So um, I think that um, the general explanation or the easiest explanation is a systematic one, that these are students who um, have criticisms of the West generally, uh, who feel that this is accessible to them um, who um, don't feel that they know or, or are engaged enough in foreign issues to criticize. Um, certainly, uh, they, they have um, plenty of boldness uh, when it comes to certain issues, but this is the explanation, I think, that, that, that makes the most sense, that, that they feel they don't know anything about Iran. So it is, I think, on us on some level to talk more openly and, and honestly about um, the uh, the Iranian regime's human rights abuses um, about the um, uh, the origins of the the revolutionary origins of the regime uh, about their activity regionally and in fact internationally um, and perhaps their their um, attempts to uh, to shift the debate in the United States as well um, so uh, it it deserves to be said it, to sort of call back to my story that when I wrote that piece. Uh, the environmentalists responded, um, which I really appreciated, um, a thoughtful response in which they said that it would be colonialist for them to uh, criticize China for developing. Um, that China's a developing country and they have every right to so on. So I, I really think that um, this is the origin of our, th th these are, there's a two part origin to our problem. And the first is perhaps too much antipathy to the, uh, the values which we are trying to defend in the first place, values of liberal democracy, um, the, the moral righteousness of, of the United States and the West, and, and in fact of Israel. Um, and, uh, and secondly, um, a problem of, of information access. These are not people who, who have a grasp or an understanding of um, Iran as an, excuse me, the Iranian regime as an actual actor, or Iran as a, as a cultural institution, but that's another matter entirely. Um, and um, I, I think that has consequences, um, that um, it, these are these are people who see uh, the world largely through what the United States should or should not be doing, and does not extend um, their uh, their their moral calculation or outrage um, beyond uh, the the borders of the English speaking world. So, I, um, I I hope that's a satisfactory answer to your question. I, I I think it really is just a matter of us speaking more more boldly and more um, uh, more intentionally about. Um, the uh, human rights abuses and the, the uh, wrongness of, of um, Iranian and, and in fact Chinese action. Um, interesting. Again, uh, you know, under the Trump administration, the State Department recognized what's going on in China uh, against the Uyghurs. The, these mass atrocities were concluded to be a genocide. Uh, that is something that should be generating a lot more outrage, not just in student circles, but in senior academic circles. And yet we are seeing, you know, some. So my question is, this lack of information that they're stating, uh, you mentioned, isn't just due to lack of ability to navigate the information sphere effectively, or is it due to corrupt efforts to, uh, to silence certain topics from being raised to begin with? And if that's the case in the academic world, where is the counter, where is the quote unquote revolutionary thinking against the authorities? Where is this rebelliousness against the imposition of narratives? Why aren't we seeing that? Why have these things become so conformist? Is that a trust to me or to Michael? Both of you in general, because I see it an issue no matter, you know, for both, for both courses actually. I think, 
Michael raised a lot of good points. And I think definitely university culture, and I think this really needs to be emphasized, promotes conformity culture in essence, especially at a large state university like mine where I previously attended. Students often live in similar housing complexes. They wear the same colors as they go to the same football games, as they go to the same fraternities. And I think the campus culture in the United States promotes conformity to an unhealthy degree to a certain extent. And I think in these Middle Eastern study departments regularly where pro-Israel voices are regularly excluded and where there are generally pro-Ottoman Empire revival narratives being taught, I think that's where the cause of concern comes in because no student likes to speak up for the most part in a culture where there is so much conformity that is pressed therein. And so I think what's important for the sake of intellectual diversity is that Middle Eastern Studies Department, which are often some of the most contested on campus, there was a book actually written by one professor regarding UTs called From Classroom to Courtroom by Professor Michael Hillman. And basically, he even noted in that book that effectively every professor, I believe, in that department believed in a single state solution in which the land was shared and that presumably Israel doesn't exist. And so what needs to be, there needs to be more regulation over hotly contested departments to ensure that there is a greater diversity of narratives being taught. Um, the departments also need to be investigated for undisclosed funding. And as it's become apparent in recent years, it's much larger of a problem than we think. I would start off at least with those two initiatives. To push back a little bit, who should be doing the regulating? Because, like, suppose during the Trump administration, you'd agree that they, uh, you know, or for instance, with governors such as DeSantis, you, you're going to have a lot of respect for academic freedom and certainly not a lot of sympathy for uh, extremist uh, regimes and uh, and the ideologies. On the other hand, we have seen under the Obama and Biden administration a great deal of leniency towards leftist uh, ideological domination on campuses, among other places, and a, a great deal of deference to um, to to academics, uh, even when they impose that sort of conformity. So, if you have a U.S. government agency in, uh, tasked with uh, with monitoring uh, these departments, who's to say that they're not just going to give them a free pass simply because they it's ideologically consistent for them uh, uh, because they reflect ideologically consistent positions from what the official position of the administration in place is. So, how how, how would that work exactly? I think just in general. State involvement would be great, considering that state gives a lot of funding to these universities to begin with. Now, I understand, I believe it's, if I'm correct, Title VI, that is in regards to university funding and higher education and complaints therein for lack of diversity. So perhaps it should be up to organizations at large, private organizations, to assume a larger role in documenting the inequity of political and intellectual diversity currently within our Middle Eastern Studies Department. Obviously we want freedom between the state and the university and what is ultimately taught. But given what is currently the crisis in the United States of Middle Eastern Studies Department constantly failing to be partial, I mean, to be impartial, excuse me, in their curriculums, it's very concerning. So I think it's probably a two-step process where perhaps the state would assume a little more authority and in investigating whether there's a plurality of narratives being taught and that's the importance it's not that one specific one is being taught is to ensure that narratives aren't being excluded and perhaps to also promote the narratives of middle eastern minorities such as the armenians the kurds all of these political, uh, excuse me, ethnic minorities in the region. And also Middle Eastern studies departments are very centered around certain narratives within the Middle East. You rarely hear about narratives from the Middle East and North Africa, especially in the Maghreb and Morocco. 
you don't hear about them from the Persian Gulf. And there are definitely a diversity of opinions which we're not hearing because the department is dominated by Ottoman-centric attitudes and often Islamist-centric attitudes. And so I would say, in essence, while it's important to maintain separation between government, perhaps have some government involvement at least to investigate whether the diversity exists, and then also strongly encourage private organizations to file Title VI complaints if they believe that certain narratives are being excluded. Now, to, to address the, uh, the continue, continuation of this topic to, to Michael and to touch a little bit more on the academic freedom aspect of this, uh, we have seen intersectionality, critical race theory, and all these uh, kind of cultural Marxist rooted narratives take hold of various departments, not just uh, social sciences, not just uh, international relations, but even hard sciences across the campus is creating further conformity uh, for the climate where, where differences of opinion are stifled. And, and the question is, if, if rising academics, if graduate students, or even college students were to write, speak up against these, uh, these phenomena, which very much play into the hands of foreign regimes, even if they're domestic based and even if the funding for them comes entirely from US sources. Uh, how, what would happen? How can one break through this uh, academic climate without being penalized and having their careers, uh, academic careers ruined entirely or just being able to, to break through the noise and being able to, 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 to respond to all of this? So, can that still happen, even, especially at top universities such as Harvard? Yeah, um, this is a this is a great question, but I, I, I want to answer it. But before I get to that, I just wanted to offer one more thought on on what Jordan was saying. Um, you know, you, you asked earlier about whether or not students, um, if this is a problem of students navigating the information environment, um, okay. and I. Uh, completely understand this uh, concern that all three of us have with wanting uh, Middle Eastern studies departments or Near Eastern studies departments to um, be uh, uh, more holistic or fairer um, in uh, their treatment of these issues. But I think it deserves to be said that most of um, the people who we are talking about when we talk about students are not Middle Eastern studies uh, students. They're in fact, you know, they're business students or they study politics more likely and just happen to have an interest in the Middle East. Or, uh, or so on, that um, you know, these are um, not people who are necessarily interested in the first place in navigating the information environment of the Middle East. Um, and it's, it's fought among, um, uh, you know, th these are issues that are fought among a broader base of students and a broader base of citizens um, than, just, uh, than just us and people who are very interested in these issues. Um, and so I think that it's really a, a matter of how it's ultimately presented, which is why I talk about you know, uh, having conversations like these in which we sort of detail, here are, here are some issues um, with uh, America's adversaries and in some cases, America's allies or, or partners um, that, uh, that give people a better understanding, more educated understanding of uh, where we are as a country and, and the, the global environment that we're responding to. Um, and, and it's a sad, you know, because most of what these students see, all they know of the Middle East are BDS movements on their campus, which, um, you know, it gives them a very, I think, biased and, and unfortunate uh, view um, as to um, the Middle East generally, but also especially uh, the state of Israel. That said, um, on, on, on the question of academic freedom, I, my main criticism, um, and I, I've written on this in the past, my main criticism of um, these efforts to try to overturn the current academic order or revise it in some way, um, is twofold. The first problem is that I think it is too uh, reactionary. And I don't mean that politically, but I mean that in terms of cause and effect. Uh, it is, you know, this horrible thing happened. We don't like it. There is going to be a letter sent to whatever newspaper or we are going to sign whatever petition and so on. And it's good that there's political action that is, uh, that is looking to, um, you know, respond to some of uh, some of these problems and, and to make clear that not all students are on board. It's important that you have people speak, speaking out, especially as Jordan said earlier, that, you know, these are 
uh, campuses are, are uh, you know, petri dishes of, of thought and it's just, it gets warm and um, you get uh, uh, people who, who tend to go along to get along and, and are w willing to, uh, you know, believe certain things or pretend to believe certain things more importantly um, for the sake of their own career and, and peace. Um, so you have a lot of, um, of social pressure. Um, so it's good that you have people breaking this, uh, but th this can't be the entirety of the strategy. There has to be some kind of alternative um, put in. And um, this uh, alternative is not always clear from our perspective, what exactly, how exactly we want people to be taught if not in the current system. Um, there's not enough conversation about what a university is and ought to be, uh, what our departments are and ought to be, how, how campuses ought to be governed. Um, you know, it's, I, I did my undergraduate years at Cornell University and uh, it's a very difficult kind of power relation, right? Because there is a, uh, there's a student assembly that ostensibly has control over all of these um, shallower issues like, like BDS and so on. By a shallow, I mean, I mean more recent issues, whereas all of the, um, you know, all of the meaningful, you know, hiring and firing and so on is left instead to uh, the university. Um, when in fact, you know, there is no such power balance and uh, the university runs everything, and um, it becomes instead this uh, this conflict uh, between um, between people who 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 don't like how things are being done, and the university says, you know, there is no other way. Um, so that's the that's the first issue I think is is this question of reaction. And the question is, what actually is the alternative um, to this either overlapping governing structure or you know this kind of you know education format? Um, and uh, I strongly believe it's it's a return to the liberal arts. I strongly believe it's a it's a return to classical education, and uh, in trying to raise expectations for students um, in a in a way that that empowers them and and makes them um, as educated people should be citizens rather than subjects and um, and and thinkers rather than people who are simply acted upon um, and, and you know true adults. And it, it, this isn't the way that we're approaching it now. Even when we discuss alternatives, we say in terms of alternatives, well, we need more vocational uh, education, or we need, um, you know, education that that uh, helps people resist, uh, you know, fake news, and uh, you know, what will teach them critical thinking. Um, and it's always escaped me, um, that, you know, how exactly we are going to teach students critical thinking, but. Um, I think this is the this is the important point is that we um, these are these are very macro level issues that that you know academic freedom and in fact a university relies on a certain level of seriousness um, that um, requires us to to come up with our own theories and suggestions specific things that for universities to do differently on a systematic level not just spend money on this and not that you know don't hire another diversity coordinator please we need more classicists you know is maybe a good start, um, but I, I think um, we also need a, an understanding of how these students are engaging in their education in the first place. Just just to continue with that for a second, there are, there are those voices, and I have no opinion personally either way, that the claiming that the traditional university model is breaking down due to online activity, that many people don't want to pay exorbitant prices, some of which go towards unrelated activities the, among them diversity coordinators but also just you know accesses that are not directly related to education needs and they go to the available free online resources do you think that solves the problem exacerbates the problem is unrelated to to the problem completely is just you know doesn't really ad address anything what's your opinion do you actually believe that's a viable alternative to the current structure and do you think it will actually uh, address the issues or is it just another form of saving money but not necessarily saving minds so to speak i thank you michael um i personally think that it's better ultimately for maintaining the integrity of thought in a sense, when people come to university, university often politicizes everything and students don't have the opportunity to self-reflect. And I think by education becoming at least more online, 
there's mm -hmm. still a little bit more freedom for students to be able to determine what they want on their own accord. That being said, the media outlets that students are more likely to access, especially on the Middle East in terms of Western media, are still likely to come to the same conclusions as they would actually on campus. But I think the better part is, at least by being on their own accord and their independent capacity as students in their own homes, they get to decide when they want to become political and when they do not. And I think that is a huge benefit to education that has become online. I also think that there is less pressure to disagree when you are on your own. And so students might actually speak up more if they're more incensed about the opinions because they won't have to bump into the professor on a day-to-day -day basis other than on a screen. That being said, they still could be concerned about grade discrimination, which is a very real threat in universities. And so I think ultimately it should at least depoliticize education to a certain degree because that element of conformity will be removed. Do you think, though, that sheltering students from uncomfortable interactions is necessarily the best way to encourage a, a more free mindset to them? I definitely think students should be exposed to both sides of any narrative or to more than both sides, depending if there's a plurality. I think students should always engage with opinions they don't agree with. And that was my whole experience in my Middle Eastern Studies department all the way until I graduated. Um, there were very few pro-Israel narratives taught. And even when professors who were considered pro-Israel, who were considered generally to be pro-Israel did teach courses, their curriculum was very watered down, ultimately to become, I would say, a 50-50 narrative in which either narrative could assume, I would say, the general nature of what the curriculum was. And so it was always the pro-Israel courses I was being taught where Israel criticism was being offered, but as well, general praise for what Israel actually is and its modern capacity was also being disclosed not the same way around in other classes for the most part. And so I think students should be encouraged. And I think in every Middle Eastern studies degree, I think students should have to take a class regarding the Israeli narrative of history as well as the Palestinian. Then again, that's up for the curriculums to decide what to do, but I think that's a good start. And I also think that there should be classes taught on the proxy wars going on at least that were going on and still could be in Arabia, that nobody seems to really expertise themselves in today because Middle Eastern Studies departments are so focused on either Egypt and or the Levantine area. And there's so much more that needs to be taught about the Middle East before students are graduating. And they're still living, unfortunately, in this pan-Arab era when they graduate and all they really know is about the aspirations of perhaps Nasser, maybe a little bit about Sadat, about Hafez Assad, but they don't really know much more else about what's going on in the current day. And that's very important for contextualizing everything. That said, the GCT states themselves are not always forthcoming about the proxy wars and internal conflicts. So it takes a bit of skill to navigate that, that at least being fairly acclimated to, to, the, to the cultural um, way of addressing Issues. Now, I want to address kind of an elephant in the room. Um, for the last four years before the Obama, before the Biden administration, um, there was a great deal of discussion about the foreign funding. The, the Department of Education was investigating certain universities for foreign funding for, from various states. Uh, uh, there were multiple articles by various uh, uh, think tanks discussing and addressing the issue. But when it comes to actual numbers, correlations, what courses are being sponsored by whom and what is the effect and what type of texts are being used and what is the bias in those specific texts, there is remarkably little material. So there's a lot of very general thing. Oh, Qatar is sponsoring this and China is sponsoring that. And there is a lot of pro-Iran deal sentiment in that department, but there's not really a lot of specific studies 
showing, first of all, uh, the funding for what courses, where does it come from, who, what, what departments, what courses, what professors, and what materials are these state and non-state actors responsible for? And, and second, there's a very general correlation between students for justice in Palestine and general anti-Israel sentiment and various activities, but again, not a lot of systematic analysis. I'd like to understand why is it that there is we keep saying and accepting in very unscientific and unacademic terms the situation on campuses. But you know, in order to solve any problem, you need to have a measurement of, of the extent of the problem. We have come approximately to saying, well, the situation in the Ivy League is terrible, and the situation in second tier schools is even worse. And but we're not really discussing the measurables of polls of data them. We have some better understanding of the number of uh, conservative versus uh, progressive professors, faculty, and so forth, but not really regarding these foreign issues. And my question is why? We've had every opportunity to study that. It would have uh, benefited everyone to disclose that sort of information to raise those specific questions. The think tanks that are criticizing the situation are still out there repeating the same talking points, but there's not a lot of new data. Why is that? What happened? How can we even begin to solve the problem without having that data-driven understanding of, of its extent? And that's the question to, to both of you. I'm, I'm genuinely curious how, how that came about, that there's so little factual specific uh, information. Good question. Um, I don't have an explanation as to why uh, there haven't been studies like this. I can imagine there would be uh, a great amount of hesitance uh, with students in engaging in such study, especially given the current climate. But I mean, given anonymity and so on, I, I agree with you. There's no reason why a study like that shouldn't exist. It would be interesting to see over time, especially. Um, I um, We do have, have some measurable things maybe that we can uh, that we can draw from but all of these are specific cases rather than data um, so we can look at particular um, instances of, of BDS debates or, or debates about uh, renaming or, uh, or reframing even um, uh, certain departments uh, which classes are offered um, and, and and maybe get into that data um, but a lot of these require I think a, a lot of you know, not systematic, but actually very uh, involved particular analysis, um, which is, is interesting, but might say more about the university than it does about the issue uh, necessarily. Um, I, I do think, and, and this, is, um, this is my conviction just from what I've seen, that uh, most people have no opinion on these subjects, which is when, what, what I was saying earlier when I said that, you know, there's, there's no interest in the first place in navigating the information environment. People want to do other things. And they will be shaped, however discreetly, by um, uh, by by conversations from dedicated actors. Um, and uh, of those who are opinionated, I think it's a matter less of I, I guess it's, it's somewhat a matter of persuasion and the popularity or unpopularity of certain thought. But I, I think uh, importantly, it's also a matter of organization. Um, that uh, there's there's a lot of uh, there, there are. A, great number of anti-Israel forces on campus. They are remarkably organized. Um, there are a great number of pro-Israel forces on campus and, and they are um, well also, you know, in many cases, well organized. Um, and it's really a question of sort of how can we, how can we assemble groups of people who are um, like-minded and willing to transmit a certain message in a way that um, is actually accessible to people who would not otherwise be interested. And I think that is a very on the ground, you know, grassroots kind of interaction and, and doesn't necessarily come through the news media. But that might be my just optimistic, naive <laughs> take in, in that case. So I kind of want to, you know, start to conclude the conversation uh, and to drive point to, to one of the, to the issue of risk of effective response and tools for students to respond to these to political issues, to informational issues, as well as uh, issues that concern them directly. Jordan recently 
uh, had an experience while in dealing with a question of academic boycotts, uh, not related to Israel, this time related to, comp to US companies uh, selling uh, weapons and materials to Saudi Arabia, UAE. We're beginning to see that there are movements to boycott these companies as well as, uh, you know, potentially products from those countries as well uh, that are being generated just as at one point BDS against uh, ties with Israel be became uh, an academic phenomenon of the sorts of, you know, this, uh, eventually there was a fairly aggressive legislative and other pushback, but for a while it seemed a real concern. Uh, Jordan uh, observed some of this with the student assembly students Senate, how they dealt with this issue. What do you think is the direction uh, these student governments and student groups are taking with respect to developing an effective policy for dealing with uh, political controversies and um, being potentially influenced by outside information, by the media, by the generic narratives, and essentially imposing political dis decisions on the groups of people they represent and how, what tools can be de delivered to help them make those decisions more effectively if they have to be taken at all and to empower students who are not part of the government groups to to be able to push back against decisions taken on their behalf i think that's a very good question and thanks for the shout out I think there are several initiatives that can be taken at least from a student government level. Now, a lot of students don't take student government seriously. And that's the danger of what the consequences are because then student governments will pass initiatives bearing the stamp and authority of the university and therefore proponing a political status quo for the rest of the campus. My concern when it comes to everything is protecting the narratives that are not being taught and protecting the narratives, whatever they may be, and at least affording them some opportunity to be exchanged on a university campus in a free capacity. And when it comes to universities, the initiative that I basically sought to bring forth was to show that the students who were proposing a boycott initiative of companies involved in supposedly having any ties to Saudi Arabia's involvement in the war on Yemen was to demonstrate that the students who were proposing these initiatives knew nothing about the conflict that was going on and basically trying to demonstrate a need to listen to experts in their fields and to promote diversity in opinion, which they were not doing. And ultimately, that's how we succeeded in our campaign. But I think also important to note, going back just quickly to the last question in regards Actually, I'm going to add one more point. The other thing we can do for student governments is to often remind student governments the purpose for which they were created and how they have strayed from their constitutions. Student governments were often formed to serve the student body on matters that pertain to the student body. And resolutions that single-handedly force the student body to choose one political narrative over another not only endangers free speech, which needs to be emphasized in these counter campaigns, but I mean, at the same time, it strays from the explicit purpose of what, of what student government was created to address under these constitutions. And so other initiatives that could be promoted would be amending the constitution to not allow students to vote on non-pertinent political matters affecting campus. Because even, I believe there's a federal statute out there that acknowledges that you cannot force people in a capacity to take stances on political issues that is within your right and if I, and in essence this basically imposes other people's views onto you limiting your free thought and free speech um the other point i want to make is at least going back to why studies are so difficult it's hard to track 2019 the known funding from qatar was 1.5 billion 2021 it's 5 billion it's very difficult to track but there are some objective things we can track for instance, Qatar's, the universe, US universities who have campuses in Qatar cost about $404 million a year to operate. So it's very difficult how to study, but more stuff needs to be done. My uh, last question uh, is, to, is to Michael, uh, which is to account for the irrational 
uh, thought process and irrational emotional uh, manipulation of students. Uh, and by these narratives, uh, I think it's we can discuss effective tools, we can discuss models of governance and models of uh, education. But ultimately, a lot of it comes down not just to effective thinking, but the current climate with, which encourages irrationality, emotional, uh, highly personalized approach to everything, including controversies, a very kind of offense-driven tribalist, I would say, mindset that's more one that's prevalent in that used to be even more prevalent in the GCC culture, but now has apparently uh, tra trans. Uh, uh, has been transported to to the yes campuses and beyond. How do we develop a way of fighting that form of informational and ideological warfare that feeds off emotions and that does not necessarily make it easy to introduce rational arguments, uh, critical approaches, classical liberal um, ways of looking at the world and so forth. How do we break through the current status quo, which is driven by, uh, you know, gut feelings, emotions, offenses, and so forth? It's uh, a big question to end, and um, it, you know, obviously, it's a, it's a very important one. Um, I think the um, an important principle of the liberal education, uh, properly understood, uh, is a, a sense of moderation, um, sense of you know we don't want, and, and this sort of goes back to my criticisms, I feel that we've been been too reactionary, um, as in cause and effect, not politically, but um, the, um, uh, you know, the, the response, of course, to an overly emotional politics is, you know, a desire to go back to rationality and, you know, facts and logic, kind of, this is very frequently invoked. Um, but, you know, we, we do want um, students to, to feel something. We want them to be emotionally invested in their work and, and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, at the same time, we obviously um, want to oppose tribalism and, and encourage people to interact with their studies in a way that um, is, is useful and is growth oriented, is truth oriented. Um, and I think the, the way to do that is um, first in our manner and our um, the way that we engage with others I think that we need to be more optimistic and more um, you know more more uh, willing to engage with people uh, about about the truth it's very easy to get pessimistic and frustrated with uh, the state of campus but I, I, my my years on campus taught me that um, people um, are still persuadable um, and uh, they simply don't want to be lied to. So if we uh, if we are straightforward and, and honest, I think that will get us far. Uh, and um, the second thing is, um, I think uh, we we preach a certain kind of a uh, certain type of learning. Um, and I think Jordan was kind of touching on this before. Um, but we preach a certain kind of learning that isn't um, doesn't require you necessarily to believe anything. Uh, it doesn't um, expect a certain kind of person to result from the education. Um, now, uh, I have a belief, as, as I hope you do, that you know the truth is magnetic and people will be drawn to it in, in any case. So I, I hope that we all end up uh, close, to the, close to similar conclusions. Um, but I think we want to go to students and say, you know, we want to give you the facts we want to talk about it, and we want to give you uh, a great amount of agency in this process. Um, not in a way that sort of we have now in which the students get a veto over the professors or over the university or the students run their own education um, and the foxes guard the hen house and it's all very, uh, but instead, you know, we, we want something that's truly interactive, you know, and is, is, um, is both ways. Not one that does away with academic hierarchy, but one that really situates you know, the, the person at the center of, of the liberal education. So, you know, as opposed to being told what to think, we promise we are going to give you some things that will help you think. Um, and I, I think that approach will, will help a lot, especially when we're discussing things like this on, on Middle Eastern studies, where I think a lot of students just feel lost, just don't know, feel like they have to take a side of some kind and don't know on what basis they would take the side in the first place. 
Um, so I, I really think it's about that, um, given the resources and, you know, it, uh, if you build it, they will come. You know, I find that it's the point that you just made about uh, with the Middle East in particular, people feeling like they have to take a side and that kind of brings us back to Jordan and his comments on the minority narratives. I think to some extent that this comes from education that's oversimplified rather than showing the complexity of the fact that people are not always victims or oppressors that at different times they can play different roles and sometimes even oppression is you know relative to other concerns over that particular time period or situation meaning sometimes what you see as an oppression is a power struggle it's not necessarily an oppression for the sake of imposing deliberate abuses sometimes you see different different age people with agencies attempting to share resources territory power and it one side wins another side loses but it's not necessarily due to one side being a tyrant sometimes you just lose and sometimes you figure out how to share your resources in an equitable manner and sometimes you don't even if you're trying to and and sometimes you have more than one side and sometimes all sides are causing some level of damage to one another. And, and I, I think that sort of complexity of human interaction is just not being reflected a lot of the times. And uh, certainly not by the media in education. Uh, I guess it would have to, you would have to look at the course, but this, that sort of nuance, this nuance thinking of having to struggle with understanding but wait how is that possible when they just did this to the other people that's missing causing people to have to struggle with their education to have to think to question and to be uncomfortable i think that that kind of uh, discussion is has been lost the very complexity of it and uh, it doesn't you know whatever the background of the professor ottomanist or north african or whatever there seems to be um a lack of a lack of emphasis on understanding other perspectives that you do not necessarily agree or even sympathize with but you at least they are motivated by something and you need to understand those motivations even if you choose to to distance yourself from the, from from them or from sympathizing and that that i think is the one big missing factor as far as i see and uh, i i really hope we can find a way of reintroducing it to the discussion, which may help with navigating the emotional field just as much as the informational field in responding to these issues. Uh, well, thank you both very much for joining me and thank you for your insights and which which made me think a lot, <laughs> a great deal and very differently. And, uh, and I thank you both for that. I hope to, uh, to return to these issues in the future to continue with discussions with you both on these and other topics and uh, best of luck uh, in your endeavors as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.